dear colleagues and Nippon fellows, interns, it's uh, again a pleasure to see you today for the second session of the presentation of the results of the, the research made by the Nippon fellows this year. Uh, the schedule has been slightly advanced today to enable more questions to be raised and to be still on time. We have also uh, for you, for the Nippon Fellows, have a special program. There is snow in Hamburg in March. I heard from some of you that it's the first time you experience snow. Therefore, uh, that, that was a special feature, an additional feature of this uh, program. But uh, without waiting, uh, I would like to ask Mrs. Julieta Abgarian from Armenia to uh, make a presentation on the role and significance of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in the progressive development of the law of the sea. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you. Honorable President, honorable judges, distinguished members of the tribunal, good afternoon. My name is Julia Tabgarian. I'm from Armenia, as Mr. Gutierrez told before. And uh, today, I, uh, the topic of the research that I made after finalizing Nippon Capacity Building Program is the role and significance of international tribunal for the law of the sea in the progressive development of the law of the sea. Uh, in the research, we seek the task to find out whether ITLOS has helped to systematize law of the sea, to make its rules more precise and the obligation of states more clear. Uh, the methodology of the paper is the following. We investigated, first of all, the question of the general capacity of international courts to promote the development of international law. Then, the special place of ITLOS in the development of the law of the sea. And in the third chapter, we analyzed the work of ITLOS uh, in different spheres of the, in elaboration of rules in different spheres of ocean activity using here a case-by-case -case study basis. Uh, well, in the very beginning of the research, we investigate, as I mentioned before, the question related to the capacity of international courts to promote development of international law. From the very beginning of the existence of international court, courts, no doubt existed as to the role of courts to formulate international law. As Kamarovsky told in his first ever book about international courts, he suggested that the courts must possess a competence to compose international law. Uh, the, idea, the same idea has been reproduced in the book by Herge Lotterpacht. And he wrote, and I quote, Though the need to have such a tribunal, which would by its permanence guarantee development of international law, was one of the main reasons to create the Permanent Court of International Justice. The jurist, who in 1920 drafted its statute, did not fully evaluate the respective potential of the court. It's, all, it's well known that the main role of international courts is to settle disputes submitted to them by peaceful means. Uh, and applying the existing law. But it's not a rare case that judges cannot find a clear norm. And it seems quite, quite logical to formulate a new one. Some authors straightforwardly maintain that this must be a judge's duty to fill the gaps in international law. Well, uh, a review of the practice of international courts show the tendency of the courts to lean on its decisions and follow them. The permanent course of international justice in Mavromati's case noted that it has no reason to deviate from the construction which was built on the previous decisions. If the court, of course, find the, uh, uh, the argumentation of the previous decision reasoning, reasonable. In its practice, the permanent court not once referred to its previous decisions and consultative opinions. And, um, Concluding, I would like to note that a rule formulated by a court for the parties in the dispute can be later uh, applied, uh, can be later accepted by other actors of international relations. Repeated application of the rule leads to the formation 
a repeated application of the rule together with the opinion juries leads to the formation of a custom and then the rule becomes part of general accepted international law. This is the way of development of international law by the courts, which has a sign of precedent. Yet there is another way of development of international law by courts. It is when the decisions of the courts are taking active part in the codification process as a preparatory materials. Now I would like to proceed with the second chapter of my research, which is, which is dedicated to the special place of Idlos in the development of the law of the sea. I'm sorry for that you can't see the, the word. Um, there are several, uh, I would like to mention first that Idlos was established by the United Can uh, Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, the convention has a long history of its elaboration and its text was finalized in course of nine years of long negotiations between numerous groups of interest. But finally, uh, the convention man, uh, codifies the whole existing international law and developed also new legal concepts that are now in everyday use. What is interesting for us in the convention is that it contains an innovative system for the settlement of dispute which is considered to be one of the most far-reaching and complex system of dispute settlement in international law. The convention gives rise to the states to opt for one uh, to opt as a compulsory uh, dispute settlement mechanism uh, one of the four um, means it is either to resort to international tribunal for the law of the sea or to international court of justice or to ar arbitral tribunal and the and, uh, or the special arbitral tribunal. While talking about the role of ITLOS here, we should mention several uh, characteristics uh, of uh, international tribunal. First of all, it's the broad re recognition of its jurisdiction by the state. Nowadays, 37 states have chosen ITLOS as an obligatory means for the settlement of their disputes. And this number of states is not, the, uh, uh, is not, um, mm, uh, this is not a big number, but in comparison with, others, uh, with uh, other states that have opted for ICJ or arbitration, this is bigger. Uh, and uh, the second characteristic of it loss is the compulsory jurisdiction of the tribunal recognized by the convention, such as prescription of provisional measures pending the constitution of an arbitral tribunal and prompt release of the vessel. Uh, these two uh, characteristics um, distinguish it loss from other means of peaceful settlement of disputes established by the UNCLOS. But we should not forget about the fact that the wide range of uh, it loss possesses also a wide range of jurisdiction on interpretation or application of the convention and other international agreements related to the purposes of the convention. And of course, we should not forget about the advisory jurisdiction on international seabed matters. Uh, now I would like to uh, speak uh, quickly about the third chapter of my research, which has an analytic character. And here we investigated some of the cases decided by the tribunal in order to see whether ITLOS has helped systematization of the rules of the sea. All the cases investigated in the present research presented interest within the question of elaboration by ITLOS, uh, different rules uh, in different spheres of the ocean activity. And uh, I would like to mentioned the, uh, these uh, groups of rules. First of all, the questions related to the detention of foreign vessels in the EEZ. And of course, uh, it lost clear up uh, provisions regarding to the amount of bond or other financial security that should be paid by a uh, vessel uh, for, for its release re relief. And then the question of confiscation, the genuine link between the ship and the flag state, also uh, provisions regarding protection and preservation of marine environment, responsibility of states in the area, and delimitation. Uh, as I'm sh short of time today to speak about all of the, qu all of the uh, 
spheres. Though in my research, I went into great details analyzing case by case. Today, I would like just to mention the last part, the part connected with the delimitation of mar maritime boundaries. Uh, here, uh, the, um, we should uh, mention the case uh, adjudicated by the tribunal uh, on the 14th of March, 2012. And uh, this case is connected with the dispute uh, boundary delimitation, the maritime boundary dis delimitation between Bangladesh and Myanmar. And this is the topic of discussion nowadays, because first of all, this is the first ever case on maritime boundary delimitation adjudicated by the, by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And second, this is the first ever case in the International Law of the Sea when the question of the delimitation of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles was touched. And here I would like to uh, quote Judge Travis, who uh, declared in his opinion that, uh, to the case that with the present case, with the present judgment, the tribunal becomes an active participant in this collective interpretive endeavor of the convention. While it has adopted the methodology developed by the International Court of Justice and recent arbitral awards, the tribunal has also contributed its own grain of wisdom and particular outlook. The most important, in my view, in this case, is the conclusion that any delimitation is subject to general international law. The tribunal concluded that the, the delimitation method to be employed in the present case for the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles should not differ from the method employed for the delimitation of continental shelf within 200 nautical miles. Accordingly, the equidistance relevant circumstances method continue to apply for the delimitation in the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. And it was decided that the boundary between the parties overlapping continental shelves shelf beyond 200 nautical miles should be a continuation of a single maritime boundary until it reached the areas that affect that affects the uh, rights of the third states. Here I mean India. And uh, concluding my speech about the contribution of ITLOS to the progressive development in the law of the sea, I would like to mention that ITLOS has already made much for the development of the law of the sea, especially in determination of those institutes which were not clearly enough provided for in the UNCLOS. And I wish that the tribunal would deal soon with new and complex, complex cases and will develop new and new provisions uh, and will develop new provisions, yes, of UNCLOS. Thank you very much for your attention. Judge Yanai, thank you very much for your interesting question. I would like to answer this question, again referring to the recent case adjudicated by the tribunal, it's dispute uh, between Bangladesh and Myanmar, about the maritime delimitation, maritime boundary delimitation. Here we see that the tribunal is very consistent in its method used, used to delimit the maritime boundary. It, um, didn't deviate from the method that was proposed before by ICJ in the case Romania versus Ukraine. But it uh, elaborated in its way the, the same method. But it shows that there is no fragmentation, there is no substantive fragmentation, because the method is 
has been applied the same. And I think that the answer to your question is the second the second part that you suggested, that these three forests work more in connection with each other than in, um, uh, than in um, uh, fragmenting each other, yes. Uh, well, um, the importance of the Sibut <laughs> Chamber, uh, Judge Turk, thank you very much for your question. And this is really a very interesting question. Um, recently, Sibut Dispatch Chamber uh, gave an advisory opinion regarding the responsibilities of the states uh, regarding the, um, uh, the spo uh, yes. Spo uh, sponsoring the activities in the state. Thank you very much. And uh, by this advisory opinion, uh, CB Dispute Chamber again um, uh, contributed a lot to the question of what should be the scope of obligation of the states. Uh, and also for me, the important question was that in this advisory opinion, uh, the Seabed Dispute Chamber decided that the developed states as well as the developing states will have the same scope of liability as to the, uh, as to the activities in the area. And I think that advisory function of the Seabed Dispute Chamber is really very important today as states uh, prefer to, as states prefer to seek from time to time more advisory opinion that it is not binding upon the states than to resort to uh, judicial procedures. So that's why I think that the, the role of Sibet Dispute Chamber is very important as well as the tribunal. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have mentioned, you made reference to case 16, and I think the next statement will be devoted to, to in particular, to case 16. Uh, Mr. Sunlin will speak to us about comparative study of the judgment of case number 16 and Myanmar's legal positions before the tribunal. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, distinguished judges and ladies and gentlemen. My topic is comparative studies of judgment of case number 16 and Myanmar's legal position from before the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. Today is a special occasion because 14th March. I remember last year, 14th of March, the tribunal announced this judgment. Today is the anniversary of this judgment. Uh, as you know, this, uh, th th this is a uh, tribunal's first maritime delimitation case, and then first adjudication of maritime delimitation in Asia, and then first judicial delimitation of the areas or other limits of Indonesia beyond the Nautica mines. Everybody said, everybody talk about this case, very popular in the law of the sea field. Under this topic, I'm analyze the judgment and Myanmar legal position. As Shelley's own, I evaluate Myanmar's submissions to the tribunal and reflection of the judgment. As you know, both of parties are members of the Anglos, but they didn't make declarations under Article 27 of the Anglos. Originally, both parties didn't choose this tribunal jurisdiction. So Hong Kong, the tribunal become a competent jurisdiction in institution to handle this case. We have a lot of negotiation process, but we didn't get agreement common, on common ground. In the, uh, this 1974 and second round of the negotiations, both party 
delegation leader signs one of the agreements. This agreement became very important legal issues in this case. But in the meantime, the Bangladesh informed Myanmar to, do, to result by the forming of the trial unit under NS7. In the meantime, both state agreed to settle the case in this tribunal. And then on 14, 2009, the case entered in the list of this tribunal, case number 16. So if we look at the judgment of case number 16, we can see three main parts. The territory C is at Kondesha with the two not get mines and Kondesha beyond two under not get mine. Again, we can see territory C parts. There are three main issues. First issue is what is the size and shape of the Kondes a territorial sea angles to given to the same one island. Second one, what mothers was used to delimit areas of territorial sea? That's one, 1974 and 2008, agreed minister legally pioneers not. Bangladesh argued that the delimitation line in this territorial sea has been already delimited in 1974 agreement. Myanmar said, this is just a Record of minutes, uh, minutes, minutes, it is not legally binding. Why? The, tr the tribunal, Myanmar, the tribunal rejected Bangladesh argument that this agreement is not, no more, uh, not legally binding, no more than a record of condition understanding and the agreement is not, it is not agreement within the minutes of uh, Article 15 of the convention. And then Myanmar argued this to draw Media line between Saint and Island and Myanmar coast, and then to give held affair to Saint Island. Although the tribunal drew media line Saint Islands and Myanmar coast, but tri tribunal gave full affair to Saint Island because significant feature of island size, population, and ec economic activities. Another one. This is EZ Kondesh Chef with the story not come mines. Bangladesh accused, proposed to use Anget by certain matters. Once again, Myanmar proposed to use equidistant circumstances, relevant circumstances, and methods. Tribunal reached its Bangladesh proposed methods and get by certain methods. This is Bangladesh proposed methods. Tribunal agrees Myanmar proposed methods, equidistant circumstances, and methods. But the tribunal used three stage process based on the uh, equidistant circumstance methods. Tribunal, firstly, tribunal to draw a professional equidistant line. Tribunal selected base point border particles. Tribunal relied on five base points designated by Myanmar. And the tribunal chose new points for more equitable professional equidistant line. And the tri tribunal drew provisional equidistant line relying on these six points. And then tribunal considered this pro determined, and the tribunal determines that provisional equidistant line should be adjusted because concavity of the Bangladesh coast. Finally, tribunal drew equidistant, adjusted equidistant line in the areas of the EZ and continental shelf. This is continental shelf, 200 nautical mile, beyond 200 nautical mile limits. In this past, it's very controversial because Myanmar argues that the tribunal has no jurisdiction power to delimit beyond 200 nautical mile limits. That's, that is why Myanmar submit this. The establishment uh, coordinator chef has not been established on the basis of the recommendation of CLCS. The tribunal cannot delimit the provisional line on hypothetical basis without knowing what order limits are. But the tribunal rejected Myanmar argument. Tribunal held that its judgment, it has jurisdiction to delimit beyond 200 nautical mine. Myanmar also argued that Bangladesh has no continent beyond 200 nautical mines, but tribunal also rejected Myanmar argument. And then Bangladesh claimed that Myanmar was no entitled to continental share beyond 200 nautical mine, and then it has loaned entire, uh, entitled to entire the whole 
condemnation to a tribunal rejected. Bangladesh argued. Finally, tribunal uh, determined that both party has entitlements to beyond 200 nautical millimeters in accordance with Article 76 of the Anglos. And then tribunal rule continue the same lines to the areas of that body affairs. So I continue to investigate the delineation and delimitation process and establishment of Kunashev and CLCS. Because most of the exploration and exploitation of the marine, marine resources are not to the Kunashev. Kunashev is very, very rich marine resources. And then this area, actually Kunashev delimitation and delineation process is very controversial for the issue in current situation. As you know, Bay of Bengal very important because very rich hydrocarbon resources. Nyama also submitted CLCS regarding the outer limits continent shelf and then Bangladesh also. Nyama submitted on two, in 2008, Bangladesh submitted in 2011 before judgment. So I investigate in this part, I investigate Article 76. Article 76 is concerns the delineation process. It has 10 paragraphs. Article 76, paragraph 10 said that the provision of Article, uh, Article 76 without prejudice to the delimitation of the neighbor state. So this provision confirms this. Article 76 is concerned only Entitlement to establishment of the outer limits of continental shelf is not concerned the elimination process. The elimination process is concerned Article 83 of the ANC laws. So the tribunal judgment clarified that that application of Article 83 of the ANC law is no difference between with the beyond 200 not together. It is very clear. So in this part, I got to realize delineation and delimitation process is different in Asia. This is in the first of the ITLO decision. I asked Marshall about beyond what did not get my delimitation is first time for international tribunal or courts, and then another one great area is located beyond, uh, beyond 200 not get my from the coast of the Bangladesh and where the 200 not get my or Myanmar, the party status on this area is different. The tribunal managed this water column rights belong to Myanmar and continental shop rights belong to Bangladesh. This is very innovative part of this decision. So I would like to say, this is gray areas of the judgment. I would like to say conclusion. The eight laws has accepted the legal points of Myanmar. It is completely true. Bangladesh asked Myanmar to stop this drill in area seven in 2008. This is, they said that this is our area. That time, Yama versus uh, survey in this area. Bangladesh Navy, Navy versus call to stop testing daily. This is 87, this area. According to tribunal delimitation line, now this area is totally with this, our parts. So the tribunal delimitation line confirmed this. 87 is belong to Myanmar. Regarding the outer limits of continental shop beyond the nautical mines, I this the judgment help about the deadlock situation. Because if the tribunal didn't make decision for this part, the commission also cannot, uh, cannot make recommendation. It will be a deadlock situation. Now it land. This is very good prospect for both country. And thus, in this case, neither party had complete victory or total defeat. Myanmar won some points, lost in others. Bangladesh also won in some points, lost in others. Anyway, that marriage dispute between Bangladesh and Myanmar has been settled peacefully, enmity, good neighborliness between two nations could be maintained. This is the achievement of the, this tribunal, and I would like to conclude that the judgment of the tribunal is very balanced for both parties. Thank you very much.
still my job because I did I arrived uh, late for your presentation, but I will see you at the end of the world. I would like to put a question to both of you. Do you think the following because you have both uh, worked on Come. the obviously our case our, 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 our last case uh, on uh, the implementation of the in the MI and the and the Orange and uh, uh, neither of you have challenged the fact limiting the output of the level steps beyond 285 and uh, continued the line uh, which was uh, the limitation of the inner term level steps. Recently I heard an argument and that, that it's on that argument that I would like to have your reaction which is to say that the limitation of the outer continental shelf is, does not have anything to do with the limitation of the inner, inter, inner continental shelf because uh, uh, as we know the limitation is related to entitlement. An entitlement of the inner continental shelf is to the coast, basically 200 miles from the coast. Outer continental shelf, the entitlement basis is completely different. And should, uh, uh, and as a result, uh, should uh, have, a, we should start from a different, uh, different basis for the delimitation of the outer continental shelf. Uh, so I would like to have your reaction on that, uh, uh, that argument. Regarding the, I think, uh, delimitations of the outer limits of continental shelf has two, two features. And this establishment of delimitation line between continental shelf and seabed, and that is a seabed area. Well, I'm talking about delimitation, not delineation. Yes, I mean, this is delineation. I, another one is the establishment of uh, the uh, boundary line between over, uh, Adjacent or opposite coast. This is the limitation or the outer uh, outer limits of continental shelf. So in this case, it's very very complicated issue in this area, delimitation and delineation issues. So Myanmar submitted to establish outer limit continental shelf into a nautical mine. Submitted to CLCS in 2008 before proceeding, before litigation, very early, and then. Bangladesh also submitted his submission to CLC for establishment of outer limit continental shelf. 2011, after proceeding before, before judgment, but trying to decide the limitation line. Now, we, the fault decision, our side, Myanmar, is very complicated because the limitation power is conferred to the only CLC. We think so. Because Article 76, Paragraph 8 is directly related to the CLCS rule. So that's progress lacks and is the established uh, recommendation of the CLCS fine and binding. So we think establishment of the outer limit coordination is, chef is related to the uh, concern to the CLCS. Now the tribe you know, decided delimitation line, just own delimitation line. Because the CLC also consider uh, determines, considers Myanmar's proposal because Bangladesh object because this litigation. Now we have no overlapping area. Now CLC also can make their recommendation to border state. And then after our recommendation, we got a recommendation, we can get clear the outer limits to condition beyond our not combined. A little bit. Um, I would like just, uh, I agree with my colleague, and I would like to add that the reasoning that was used by the tribunal was that according to Article 76, the rules regarding the delimitation of the continental shelf uh, beyond 200 nautical miles, that uh, these rules can be applied as to the de delimitation beyond, as it is not prohibited by the convention. And that was the main reasoning of the tribunal. You agree? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what my question. Yes, I, okay. I mentioned it so in my research. Yes. <laughs> I agree on behalf of my government and people. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I already conclude. I already made a conclusion because we are good neighbor countries. No, we have no problem. Look at everything, including this my dentistry. We have very peacefully, very empty. We some of the economic business business and boundary also. We are very harmonic cooperation each other.